Uh, I'm Sing Wei Su, which is really hard to spell. Uh, so on the internet, I'm so many H's. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I'm a software engineer at a local cloud services provider and have um, spent the past year working in Go. Uh, but I didn't start out that way. Um, I actually didn't start out in computers at all. I was a performance major in classical music. Um, so when I heard that this uh, conference was going to be at McCall Hall, I was really excited to be on stage at an opera hall. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, I first started my software career writing Ruby, and it was great. Uh, being in Seattle is really awesome for new developers starting out in Ruby um, because there's such a strong Ruby community here already um, with lots of local meetups and conferences and opportunities to learn from people who are very experienced Ruby developers. Um, there are plenty of role models that made learning Ruby very accessible. People like Why the Lucky Stiff, um, whose artwork some of you may recognize and to whom I own, owe the title of this talk. Um, here's one of his comics. Uh, Aaron Patterson, who is part of the Ruby and Rails core and showed up regularly at local meetups. Um, people like Sandy Metz, who teach uh, classes in object orientation to the Ruby community and beyond. Sorry. <laughs> uh, oh no. I fixed it. Okay. Uh, is that better? Okay. Uh, so when I moved to Go, it felt really familiar in some ways, literally, because, uh, for example, when I went to my first GopherCon last summer, it seemed like half the people there were people I'd already met from Ruby. Um, and at that GopherCon, uh, there was a talk I attended that said how a lot of Go code looked like it had been written by Rubyists. And the way they said it, it sounded like it wasn't a good thing. <laughs> so I wanted to prove them wrong. Uh, I believe that there were aspects of Ruby best practices and design, uh, design principles that could be beneficial when carried over to other languages such as Go. So I was going to do it. I was going to prove that guy wrong. <laughs> so, so what's so great about Ruby? So first of all, everything's an object, uh, and the objects are very flexible and dynamically typed. You didn't have to worry too much about what type things were or casting them. Usually you could just call methods on them, and they would do what you would expect. And this made writing object-oriented code very easy. And while this flexibility could be a double-edged sword, there was a strong culture of test-driven development that was embraced by Ruby developers. But above all, the creators of Ruby focused on developer, ha Whoa, no, sorry. developer happiness, and the language was designed such that any trade-offs erred on the side of making it easy to use. And this was a principle that permeated the community. So when I switched to Go, it was a pretty uh, big adjustment um, uh, to go from dynamic to static, static types. Sorry, Sam, I wasn't a believer. Um, there also didn't seem to be any built-in concept of an object. Um, which, coming from a world where you could just crack open classes and monkey patch them and expect things to work without worrying too much about their implementation, it felt very restrictive. I mean, use tabs instead of spaces. So at this point, I start to question my life choices. <laughs> so today, we're going to talk about one of the main ideas uh, behind Ruby, which is that everything is an object and how that lends itself to object-oriented design. Um, given that Go did not seem to have objects in the traditional sense, it forced me to ask myself what actually were objects. The OOP, O-O-P, I never know how to pronounce this thing, like double O-P, it sounds like a really lame secret agent. All right, so the O-O-P powers that be traditionally define objects to comprise of two components, a bunch of data that usually represents some kind of state, and behavior used to interact or manipulate that data. But that's not entirely the whole picture. Uh, in the book, Design Patterns Explained, there were three levels of thinking about objects, and to quote them, uh, conceptually, uh, it's a set of responsibilities. Then at the specification level, uh, an object has a contract that it gives, which is a set of methods or behaviors that can be used by other objects or by itself to fulfill its responsibilities. Finally, at the implementation level, it was a set of code and data and computation interactions between them. So how do we transfer this approach to, uh, a, a approach to objects uh, with Go? So let's use a somewhat contrived example to illustrate our point. Some of you may be familiar with code katas or exercises that focus on a particular programming idea. We're going to look at the Gilded Rose Kata, which is a refactoring exercise. So the Gilded Rose Kata describes a system with a certain set of requirements, and here are the basic ones. All systems have a sell-in value, which denotes the number of days in which the item must be sold. All items have a quality value that denotes how valuable it is. And at the end of the day, the system lowers both values for every item. Here are some other uh, requirements, but we'll get more uh, into detail with these later. So our task is to add a new feature. We have to add another set of items that have the property of degrading twice as fast as the other types. 
So what does this legacy system look like? If you've ever inherited a legacy code base, you probably have an idea. So we just have one file, main.go, that defines the item type and instantiates a slice of items and then calls the gilded rows function. And here's the gilded rows function, or at least part of it. And here's the second half. And in its entirety, it looks like this, and I'm not even sure this will compile because I'm pretty sure there's a curly brace missing somewhere. But anyway, so I was skeptical. Uh, how did we get into this mess? This was a code exercise after all, so I felt like this must be pretty contrived. But I also knew that behind every mess, there's a story, and it's easy to resent the developer who left you with this pile of spaghetti code. Um, but any inherited system is the product of small steps that each seem reasonable at the time, and that might tell a story. So I wanted to understand and empathize with the developer or de developers who might have incrementally contributed to this code, because perhaps there were some clues, some meaningful abstractions that were being obscured by the layers. And if I could understand the process of the developers who came before me, I could maybe better understand the problem myself. Because honestly, this is a situation uh, that all of us find ourselves in a lot. And sometimes you look through the code uh, commit history and the person who wrote that code was you. <laughs> so in other words, I, I wanted to make my own mess. I wanted to reproduce this bad code to see how we got there. So looking at the requirements, uh, first, I start by writing a test because, like a good Ruby developer, a TDD had been beaten into me. I wrote a test that sort of the sell, uh, sell in quality would decrease, and then wrote a bunch of other tests uh, for all the other cases and so forth, and all those tests passed for the existing code. So that's great, and now I have a safety harness, and I was free to make as much of a mess as I wanted. So, okay, now I delete all the existing code and start from scratch myself, taking the first requirement. The system lowers the sell in value, that's easy enough, and it also lowers the quality. Looking at the first uh, spec, once the sell date has passed, the quality degrades twice as fast. So to add that second requirement, which has to do with quality, I can just do that. It's fine. Don't look at it too hard. <laughs> so moving on to the next requirement, quality of the item is never negative. Um, look at this. still has to do with quality. So I'll just wrap it. And on my test pass. So moving on to the next uh, spec, it deals with a different kind of uh, item with a different kind of behavior. Now, this was the previous code, and suppose that I wasn't the person to write this. I might ask myself, well, what's the quickest way to add the age of logic while guaranteeing the old code still works? Well, since all this stuff had to do with quality in the normal case, I'm thinking if I just want to keep the code that deals with quality for be separate, I can also just wrap that. And now I can safely implement all my business logic for age Brie and not touch anything else that came before me. Always helps to have a helpful comment in there. So now all my tests for uh, Brie pass. So suppose six months come along, new requirement comes along, and you're busy, your manager's bugging you about deadlines, or you just decided you need better work-life balance. So for whatever reason, you don't have time to understand all this other code that came before you. You just know that you have a new requirement, which is to support a new type of item that, according to the spec, doesn't appear to do anything. So instead of like going through and trying to understand all of this, I'm done. Going down this path, we eventually end up with what we set out to achieve, which was a mess. And if you're lucky or unlucky, depending on how you want to look at it, maybe somebody else comes along and tries to add helpful comments. They might even refactor slightly, but because they don't really understand it all, they don't want to touch it too much. So how did we make such a mess? Well, it was really easy. In most cases, all you had to do was add a conditional, and anyone can do that. It's fast, and also at the time, I didn't understand it, and maybe I didn't have to. Not that I couldn't have, but there could have been any number of reasons that made it that you know, my, the energy I spent into it was not worth, worth it at the time. And in fact, we're often asked to just trust that a system works without understanding it while still being asked to change it. But at some point, we still have to balance delivery with maintainability, because otherwise, you just end up getting buried. I'm not sure all the spaghetti said full on. Okay. Um, it's important to have empathy for what came before you, um, and it's easy to resent uh, the code that you inherit and to think that the person who wrote it was a bad person or a bad engineer. But if you try to understand the path it took to get to a certain point, it might help you, uh, it might help you come up with better abstractions and just to be kinder to whoever it was who wrote this mess because, again, sometimes, oftentimes, that person was yourself. <laughs> 
but ultimately we want to fix it. So how do we start to make this more maintainable and understandable? So here's what we were working with. And to go back uh, to our definition of objects, this is what the goal was to leverage um, objects and their ability to encapsulate data and behavior. And the key here is to encapsulate. We wanted to decouple the behavior of different types of things so that they can be examined independently. So we can encapsulate the path to normal objects and implement our own, functional, own function to just, just deal with them. Since I don't understand the system, I'll just return from this function. And at this point, I expect a bunch of my tests to fail. And they do. So if we uh, look back at our first pass mess, uh, we can steal the code from before it was refactored and just plop it in here. And now our normal tests pass. We can move on to the next type of object, at which point we can just change the if statement into a, into a switch statement and do the same thing with update Brie, and those tests pass. So now we need to add the next type of item, which is sulfurous. Uh, we add a case statement to capture this code path. And if you look at the spec, again, it doesn't do anything. So here, we can just uh, implement, implementing the code is really easy, and we're done. We add the last type of item, implement the c code, and here we, here's what we are left with so far. Now, before you, we move on, you might notice that in this switch statement, there's no default behavior. And looking back at the original collection of items, we see that um, in this list, we were past certain things that aren't mentioned at all in the spec. And we still need to handle those, um, but since we don't know how, we can just encapsulate the behavior and do nothing. So this looks familiar. You may remember that there was one item that also did nothing when update was called on it, and that was this sulfurous um, item, which means that this case statement is entirely unnecessary since it behaves the same way as the default, and we can just delete it. Now our case statement in Gilded Rose function looks like this. We can delete the existing mess, refactor a little bit, and all our tests pass. So now, adding the new feature. Let's look at the requirement. We need to add something that degrades twice as fast as other items. So in our code, we could just do this, add a case statement. But something feels wrong. This would be easy. It would be following the example set by what is now the new legacy code. But when new cases come along, what's going to happen? We keep adding, and our switch statement keeps expanding and expanding, and this is not what we want. As we saw in Jeff's talk, you might also be tempted to use like reflection type of on each of these item types, but that's effectively no different um, than using a case statement, and it keeps the responsibility of figuring out what to do with the different types in the main Gilded Rose function. This was simply encapsulation without using object orientation principles. And wrapping the functions does make it nicer. And if you stopped here, the code would already have improved. But it's just deferring procedures to somewhere else without changing the procedural nature of the code. What I wanted was solid design. Um, for those who may not be fluent in um, OOP jargon, solid is an acronym that represents a set of well-established principles of object-oriented design. And the code that I had before wasn't solid. And specifically, it wasn't open-closed, which is the O in solid. Open closed means that the code is open for extension and closed for modification. So in other words, instead of having to add a case statement to the main control logic of Gilded Rose, the Gilded Rose function itself, I just wanted to extend an existing abstraction. And as much as possible, I wanted to avoid modifying the Gilded Rose function. If this were Ruby, I wanted something like this, a parent item class that the other types of items could subclass from. And then I could simply extend it with a new type of item that I was being asked to support. In other words, I wanted inheritance. And you may be asking, really, in Go? Uh. So you may be skeptical. And full disclosure, I wasn't sure any of this would work either. But I had already committed to going down this path. And I was going to prove to the gopher naysayers that you could do OO in Go. So I wasn't going to let that gopher con guy like poo poo on us. So OK, this is what we were given, um, item as a concrete struct. Uh, now, one really easy way to achieve the behavior of item in all these subclasses was by just sticking it in as an anonymous struct. Um, this is a fun Go feature that here just allows you to pour over the fields and if there's any methods um, on item to everything else that I wanted to inherit from. And this approach is called embedding, but it didn't feel quite right. Inheritance, to me, is when you ask yourself if something is uh, something else. 
And embedding felt more like giving a struct or object a pointer to something else that it could use as a utility. In other words, embedding uh, was more like composition, and the way we have item defined currently doesn't really make it the right kind of thing to use to compose another object. We're gonna hand wave over composition uh, and struct embedding in Go, but we're gonna, we're, we'll come back to it later. So anyway, embedding wasn't the right approach, or at least not yet. If we go back to the definition of objects, what we're missing is the specification for that object. In other words, the contract of its behavior. And in software terms, that's an interface. And in Go, that's really easy. So instead of defining item as a concrete struct, we change it to an interface. Then we change the fields into methods and simply define the method that we want each of our subclass items to understand. So now that we've defined the interface for item, we need to write a concrete implementation for it or a subclass. So let's start with a normal class. Uh, we can define it as a struct and it needs to implement this interface. So the name, sellin, and quality methods are just getters for their respective struct fields. And for update, we can lift what we had previously encapsulated in the update function and we're done. Here's the final concrete implementation of the whole normal class. Now, if we go back to how the collection of items is created, we notice that literal items are being instantiated here. So now, that we, now, so now we have to change the original definition of item, which was a struct, and I'm pretty lazy. I'm guessing some of you are as well. So let's just do the quick and easy thing and rename it. It feels kind of like cheating because it is, but don't worry about it for now. <laughs> so now we can change this collection of items to a collection of param structs. And now going back to the control flow, control flow code, uh, the encapsulated methods, instead of just running a procedure, can leverage the objects that we just created. So in here, we can create the item object and then call up the update method on it, which is now defined on the normal object itself. So now we have a system where the item or subclass is responsible for its own behavior. But something should still feel wrong. One problem is that the item objects that we spent all this time creating creating are being instantiated from within the function call. So the update method call is hiding the fact that we are instantiating the item object as we iterate through the collection. Um, but what I want is for the object to already exist so that all I need to do is tell it to update itself. So let's reverse all that encapsulation that we just did and replace the update methods with what's actually going on so it's more obvious where the objects are happening. The other problem is that since the item slice isn't a collection of items, um, because we did that lazy thing and just renamed it, um, we, so we don't have a collection of items, it's params. And what I want is item. And params, uh, while it does the job of encapsulating data, it lacks behavior that I want out of an object, so it doesn't understand any messages that I pass to it. So what I want is for the data to go through something and come back as an item. And some of you may have an idea of where this is going. I want an item factory. So instead of this, I want something like this. I want an item factory that encapsulates the business logic for creating objects. So how do we get, how do we get there? In the famous design pattern book, The Gang of Four talks about factories this way. You define an interface for creating an object, but let subclasses decide which class to instantiate. The factory method lets a class defer instantiation to subclasses. So we can define that interface. We can take their advice and define it here. Um, and we use this to define the factories for each type of objects that we have. So previously, we created items this way. Now we, the, the factory can basically just wrap that. But a quick sidetrack, I don't want to do all this typing. Plus, it looks really bad on a slide. So I'm going to look at the definition of the normal type and see that it's, it's exactly the same as params. If I want normal to have all the same fields without doing much typing, I can just embed. And I know that I said that this wasn't the right thing to do because it's not, but it's just a placeholder. And again, we'll come back to it. So now my normal factory looks like this. And I can make my other factories the same way. And now I can replace the instantiation of the objects with the factories. But deciding which subclass factor to use, again, it's not the responsibility of the gilded rose function. The gilded rose function just wants to update the item itself. And the thing that should decide which item to create is the item factory. So we can simply move all that code into the item factory 
But we still have that problem where it uses a large case statement to decide which item to create. And as we saw before, this really isn't extensible. But what we can do is register the factories as configuration rather than business logic. So similar to what Jeff talked about in his enumerated types talk uh, with creating string table and parse table, we can create a map to look up the different kinds of factories that we know about. Then instead of a case statement here, we can simply look up the correct factory and tell it to create the appropriate item. And now we can use the item factory to return an actual collection of items. And since these are all real objects that understand messages, and we can do, we can do what we said we wanted Gilded Rose to do, which is simply call update. So where are we so far? Originally, we started out with item as a concrete struct. We made this an interface and then shunted the fields over to a params thing, which don't look at for now. Then we created an item factory to ensure that we have a collection of the correct, correct kinds of items. The item factory uses the factories specific to each item type, which are defined within the subclass. We can implement the business logic for updating each specific item as part of satisfying an item interface. And instead of having all of that in one giant method, Gilded Rose is simply responsible for one thing, which is passing along a message to an object. So a note on code organization, all of this code so far lives within the same file. So currently this is all in main.go. But even though we've broken things up, um, all this code that has to do with items, the interface, the factories, and so forth, they're also in main.go, even though it's not really conceptually part of the, the main control logic. If, again, this were Ruby, I'd probably want to wrap this up in a module or something where I can namespace anything having to do with item. In Go, we can easily use packages to create namespaces and delineate conceptual separation of concerns. So rather than having this in main, we can just put it in a different package, call it items, and we can do the same thing with item subclasses. Then all that's left to do is to import a new items package into main. And now the structure of our code looks like this, with the main control flow of Gilded Rose in main and a separate package for items and its subclasses. But there's more. <laughs> so remember how we said we'd come back to the embedding thing? So if we look at the default item type, we see that it doesn't really do very much. And if we look at the getter methods, we notice that all of these methods are duplicated in all of the item subclasses. And I don't like this duplication. I would really like the getter methods on default to be used in my other item types. I want inheritance to work like it would in Ruby, which would look something like this, with the default as the parent class taking care of all that boilerplate. And then normal, Brie, and the other child classes would just get them for free. So now we can use inheritance using embedding. So this is a thing that we've been kind of ignoring. We didn't really know how to reason about params. It was just like a lazy placeholder while I figured out the rest of the code structure. But now if I look at the default object now that it's been built, it's the same thing as params is. And our problem with params was that it, was an object, it, that, that it wasn't an object. It was just data with no behavior. However, data is the same data, but it does have the right behavior, which means that if we want normal to be able to access or inherit the getter methods that were duplicated, we can replace the embedded params with default. Now, all this getter code just goes, goes, just goes away. So now, my normal class looks like this, and we do have to change the factory method now to account for the changes, and so instead of having normal take params, we can change it to instantiate with embedded default type. We can also uh, update uh, the original data fields like so's and the other subclasses can embed default in the same way. So this means that going back to our items.go file, we don't need to use params uh, anymore at all. Then looking at the item factory, we don't need to wrap the data fields anymore in the param struct. And so it could be become simplified like so. So, finally, we can add our new feature. In my main code, I don't have to change anything, thus preserving the closed, uh, closed for modification part of the open close principle. I simply define my new item type, which I know is a kind of default, thus inheriting the three data fields and getter methods. I add a factory modeled exactly the same way as the factories for the other item types, 
And then I overwrite update, update, which is the only kind of thinking I have to do. And now the only thing that's left to do in the items package is to make sure that the item factory knows how to return this new type of item. To do that, I just register the new factory so item factory can look it up. And with that one line of code, all my tests pass. So what have we learned? For starters, we learned that um, OOP is possible in Go. Even though there isn't a built-in concept of objects, uh, Go structs can be conceptualized as a set of responsibilities. Inheritance is possible through the use of interfaces and embedding, because interfaces rep represent the specification of the object, and embedding represents a portable encapsulation of a set of data and behavior. We can also emulate the namespacing that modules provide in other languages via packages. So for all you other Rubyists or ex-Rubyists out there who are like me, we've learned that it is possible to write Go like Ruby. So we proved that guy wrong, or maybe just proved his point. Um. <laughs> but the point isn't necessarily about object orientation. Object orientation is just one tool that can be used to make your code more maintainable. A great man once said, given six hours to chop down a tree, he would spend the first four sharpening the ax. And for us, we were given a simple feature to incorporate into a legacy system. In order to do so, we ended up going down this whole path of not just refactoring, but of rethinking the entire design and architecture of the code. And it was a long and at times dubious journey with a lot of hand waving, but ultimately it made the original task extremely easy and painless. Of course, some people criticize us by saying if you give a developer six hours to chop down a tree, they would spend the first 12 sharpening the ax. <laughs> and this is not an entirely unfair criticism. We're often under tons of pressure to deliver things quickly, and that tends to be at odds with the natural impulse of engineers who like to spend 12 hours sharpening their tools. Our bosses and product managers and so forth want us all to move fast. But here's the thing for any, of, any PMs out there listening. Developers want to move fast. We do. But we don't actually want to break things. It often seems like doing things like refactoring or accounting for restructuring in your sprint planning takes up unnecessary resources and delays delivery. But good engineers invest in maintainable code in order to move fast, because ultimately that contributes to better code, better delivery, and more developer happiness. So thank you for all the people who helped uh, with this talk. Um, here's a few resources uh, that I have, and that was it.